participant in any tontine schemes of limited liability on a joint venture for profit with an insurable interest requiring me to participate in these illegal corporate Ponzi schemes? I am just Joe Blow from Kokomo down on the street. I just live at the common law, and I have a right to work and contract my labor, my skill, and my time of life as I see fit, not as some third-party arbitrary and capricious bar association sees fit. And they had loaded the court with all these attorneys, and they were, oh, you hear that guy? I said, Your Honor, the state of Michigan arbitrarily and erroneously converted my right to work into a privilege and issued a license and a fee for it. That's unconstitutional, Your Honor. Marbury versus Madison, 5 U.S. 137, 1803. Anything in conflict or repugnancy is null and void of law. Okay? Can you see that? Marbury versus Madison. And since the state converted my right into a privilege and issued a license and a fee for it, Murdoch versus Pennsylvania, no state may convert a secured liberty into a privilege and issue a license and a fee for it. And if they do, Shuttlesworth versus Birmingham, Alabama says I may ignore the license and the fee and engage in the right with impunity. That means you can't punish me. And U.S. versus Bishop, 412 U.S. 346, defines willfulness as an evil motive or intent to avoid a known duty or task under the law with a moral certainty. I submit, Your Honor, I couldn't have done an evil task because I was totally following the Constitution in the U.S. Supreme Court. I would submit that prosecution counsel's burden is to prove that I did willfully and knowingly avoid a known duty or task under the law, namely to get the license. And I would submit he specifically precluded he cannot perform his task, and therefore I'd motion for dismissal with prejudice fair state a cause of action for which relief can be granted, and I'd kind of like to collect my costs and fees for having to defend this frivolous, spurious complaint. The judge rolls back in his chair with a great big smile, and he turns to counsel for the prosecution. He says, well, Mr. Rose, what do you think we ought to do about this young gentleman? The prosecution bounces back. How about we honor the motion to dismiss, Your Honor? The judge says, good answer, because I don't think you're ready for this kid today. And the whole court broke out laughing. An old gentleman walked up to me and he said, Son, I just want to shake your hand and tell you, you got to have like King Kong. Because you just slammed the Bar Association right into the ground. On top of that, I've been an attorney for 57 years, and I just want to shake your hand, sir, and tell you that that was one of the most magnificent arguments that I've ever had the privilege to hear in a court of law. Now, he was an honest attorney, and he realized what kind of a chain was around his ankle with this bar association. And these lawyers, they resent that. They really do. They're people just like you. They don't like to have any chains on them. But they hadn't had anybody quite show them how to get those chains off. And when they saw somebody do it in their own skill, with their own, you know, with their own cards, on their own playing field, it actually impressed the hell out of them. I had several gentlemen come up and shake my hand that day. Needless to say, the case was dismissed, and I've been helping little people getting jammed for years. Every time I see some little person get jammed, I'm out there flipping that wrench. Zingy, zingy, zingy. And I flip that wrench on them so good that usually they just back off. Dr. Kevorkian was a perfect example. The poor man was uh, just trying to help these poor people. They were jamming him every which way but loose. So what we did is we taught him a thing called quo warranto. I got a hold of his attorney and submitted all of the arguments. Let me bring that up here. Quo warranto. We got the quo warranto. We brought it in here. Let's see. Just a second. Can we go to a pause here for just a second? Oh, wait. Here we go. Here we go. Quo warranto. Let's bring that up next. All right. Now, we're going to bring up several arguments right here. We're going to bring up police powers, and we're going to bring up quo warranto. Quo warranto is a basic right that goes back to English law, ancient English law. Okay, here it is right here. All right, quo warranto. Let's read it. Quo warranto. In old English practice, a writ in a nature of a writ of right for the king against him who claimed or usurped any office, franchise, or liberty to inquire by what authority he, he supported his claim in order to determine the right. It lay also in the case of a non-user or long neglected, no, long neglect of a franchise, franchise is corporation, or misuser or abuser of a franchise, being a writ commanding the defendant to show by what warrant he exercises such a f corporate franchise, having never had any grant of it or having forfeited it by neglect or abuse. 
a common law writ designed to test whether a person exercising power is legally entitled to do so. An extraordinary proceeding, prerogative in nature, addressed to preventing a continued exercise of authority, unlawfully asserted. Johnson versus Manhattan Railroad Company, New York, recorded at volume 289, United States, page 479. Now, it is intended to prevent exercise of powers that are not conferred by law and is not ordinarily available to regulate the manner of exercising such power. Now, what we did... See, police powers are defined as the right of eminent domain of a state or political subdivision to enact laws for the common good welfare. Let's pull that out. Police powers. Everybody got that? Police power, right here. Let's do police power. Right here. Police power. This is out of Black's Law Dictionary, folks. An authority conferred by the American constitutional system in the Tenth Amendment, U.S. Constitution, upon the individual states and in turn delegated to the local governments through which they are enabled to establish a special department of police, right? Such laws and regulations as tend to prevent the commission of fraud and or crime and secure generally the comfort, safety, morals, health, and pr prosperity of its citizens by preserving the public order and preventing a conflict of rights in the common intercourse of the citizens and ensuring to each an uninterrupted enjoyment Everybody get that word, enjoyment, of all the privileges conferred upon him or her by the general laws, the Constitution, the power of the state to place restraints on personal freedoms and property rights of persons for the protection of the public safety, health, and morals, or to promotion of the public convenience and general propriety. The police power is subject to limitations of the federal and state constitutions, and everybody catch that and especially to the requirements of due process. Police power is the exercise of the sovereign right of the government to promote order, safety, security, health, morals, and general welfare within constitutional limitations, right, is an essential attribute. Marshall versus Kansas City, Missouri, recorded at 35 volume, Southwest 2nd, that's another reporter, Southwest 2nd, page 877, all right? Now, police powers are the right of eminent domain of a state or political subdivision to enact laws for the common good and welfare and to curb crime within constitutional limitations. And the key words in that whole thing are within constitutional limitations. And then it tells you to see the Tenth Amendment. And when you see the Tenth Amendment, and believe it or not, you can go look up the books and it divides the Tenth Amendment real... Here, pull over here. All right. The burdens placed on the national government as a result of states regulation, okay, regulation of their internal affairs, save as Congress may act to remove them, constitute normal incidents of operation within the same territory of a dual system of government. And no immunity of national government from such burden is to be implied from the Constitution, all right? All right, Penn Diaries versus Milk Control Commission, all right, a Pennsylvania case, recorded at United, uh, Volume 318, U.S. 261. The people of the United States residing within any state are subject to two governments, one state and the other national, but there need be no conflict between the two because the powers which one possesses, the other does not. That's United States versus Cruikshank, a very famous Supreme Court case. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, we come over here. Within the area of delegated powers, expressed or implied, this amendment does not reduce the powers of the United States. That's U.S. versus Manning. Recorded at 215 Federal Supplement. That's another reporter, page 272. The Federal Union has only those powers expressly conferred on it and those reasonably implied from powers granted, while each state has all governmental powers except such as the people by the Constitution have conferred on the United States, denied to the state or reserved to the people themselves. Anderson versus Gladden, 